Hey, a pushers. So this is going to be lesson 6.1 on American immigration and urbanization. Um, we're going to be talking about people moving to the cities. So let's begin. So during the period following the American Civil War, um, during the Gilded Age, we're going to see the American population rise. Um, and it is going to double within the 30 years between 1870 and 1900. And that's pretty significant because that means you're going to have twice as many people, you're going to need twice as many houses, food, jobs, etc. And um, this is going to uh, be because not only does America have a, an increased standard of living, um, there's going to be natural population increase. You've got people having more babies and babies surviving. You're also going to have a large amount of immigration at the time, people coming into the United States from elsewhere. At this same time that the population is doubling, we're also going to see that the urban population, so the population of the cities is going to triple. And that means that um, cities are going to be overcrowded and overpopulated. And this is not just going to be people moving from rural areas into the urban areas, but also is going to include um, people moving there from outside the United States. And the reason they're moving to the cities rather than rural areas, which is traditionally been the norm, is because there are so many more job opportunities in the urban areas. That's where you're going to find all that industrialization. So the cities are going to have this massive population boom, and that is going to require them to expand outward. But as this happens, it gets harder and harder for people to get across the city. And so you're going to need things to make transportation easier. And that's where we're going to have the introduction of the electric trolley and also the cable car. Um, this is going to make it easier for people who live on the outskirts of town or have to travel across town to their jobs. But at the same time, we're going to see that at a certain point, the cities just can't grow out anymore. They have to grow up. And that is where Lewis Sullivan is going to come in. Lewis Sullivan is known as the father of the modern skyscraper. And he is going to use not only new architectural methods, but also new architectural materials like um, mass-produced steel as a way to create um, very tall buildings that uh, previously were just impossible to create. And the reason for this is because of his architectural motto of form following function, meaning he is going to make it look nice after he's figured out how to make it the most efficient and functional in the place that it is possible. So um, this is actually opposite of the way things typically had been done. Um, prior to this, uh, most buildings were made pretty and they looked at the aesthetics of it before they ever really looked at how it was going to be functional. This is why if you go into an old building, you'll see sometimes that there's like one really wide staircase and one really narrow one, and there's a really tall doorway and then a really short one. It's because they kind of figured that stuff out after the fact. But what he's going to become most known for is the dumbbell apartment. So, um, well, he does use this, you know, this idea of form-following function in buildings like the one you see here. This is the, uh, this is the Flatiron Building in New York City that was made to utilize this awkwardly shaped V, kind of triangular shaped plot of land um, in New York City. The dumbbell apartment was also designed to function um, in a way that would increase safety. Because there were so many people moving into the cities, tenement apartments were being built very fast and very cheaply. They were just long rectangular buildings that were shoved right next to each other, some of them with less than a foot of space between the buildings. And that means that there's no, um, there's no uh, opportunity for there to be windows because there'd be no light able to get in. Um, there's no ventilation and it makes it more dangerous. He creates the dumbbell apartment, which you see here, and it gets its name because it looks like a dumbbell. And what it does is it increases the amount of airflow. It increases the opportunity for there to be um, fire escapes. And these air shafts that he puts between these buildings makes it safer for people to actually live within these tenement buildings. Um, these dumbbell apartments, uh, 
yes, it was giving, I guess, technically less space for the people living in those rooms, but they at least had a window. They at least had light. Um, people prior to this sometimes actually even um, would suffocate inside these you know, these rooms because there was no windows to them. So this was an improvement for the lower classes who were living in these, um, these tenement apartments. Another thing that we're gonna see in the cities is this need and this desire for green spaces. Because they were growing up so fast and there was so much concrete and steel, we had really lost that sense of nature. And so Frederick Law Olmsted is going to be brought in to design a large centralized park for the people of New York to use as recreation. Um, because people were no longer able to, um, you know, to go outside and be in nature like they would if they were in the rural areas, we had to bring the nature to the city. And um, this was designed to rival Hyde Park in London, and in many ways it did. And it was seen as very much a marvel of the time. However, if you were wealthy and you had the means, you did not live in the city. The cities were overcrowded, they were dirty, there was smog, there was uh, garbage everywhere. So you moved out to the countryside where you had fresh air and lots of room. So we're gonna go back in time now um, to look at ancient Greece, and this will make sense in just a moment, but back in ancient Greece, there was this legendary feud between two different cities who sat on opposite sides of a harbor. And these two cities finally agreed to peace, and they wanted to ensure that there was peace um, forever within this harbor. And so they built this massive st statue that they called the Colossus. Colossus was, um, you know, dozens of feet high, hundreds of feet high, and it held this huge torch that would be lit with a huge bonfire. And this was a signal to sailors who were out at sea, not only that they were getting close to land, but also to let them know that they had reached this harbor. Because once they passed underneath the statue of Colossus, that they were in a place of safety, of refuge, a place where there was not going to be anything to be afraid of anymore. And if this seems oddly familiar to you, it's because this is one of the designs that inspired Our Lady Liberty. Now, Lady Liberty was a gift to the United States from our friends in France. And although the people of New York hated it and thought it was absolutely hideous, it very quickly became a symbol of New York and a symbol of America itself. But one thing that a lot of people tend to forget about Lady Liberty is that when it was dedicated and when there was the, um, the pedestal in which she has been placed upon, there was a competition for there to be a poem that would um, kind of signify uh, America and its place within the world. And that poem was written by a woman by the name of Emma Lazarus, the daughter of Jewish immigrants to America. And she titled this poem, The New Colossus. And you're probably quite familiar with part of this poem. And that is the part where she says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. This poem has become iconic to America. It has become symbolic of us being a country of immigrants, that we are this great American melting pot. And when you get to America and you see Lady Liberty, that it is a sign of safety, a sign of refuge, a sign of peace, just like the Colossus of ancient Greece. So prior to the Civil War, we had our old immigrants. Now, the first group of immigrants, the first mass migration that we had were going to be the Irish and the Germans. And during that pre-Civil War period, we saw that most of the people coming here were from Northern and Western European countries that had traditions in democracy. They were fair-skinned and Anglo-Saxon in their culture, their language, and their uh, traditions. Most of them were Protestant, except for the Irish, um, and generally had some level of education and some money. And so when they came here, although we were nervous about this mass migration, we didn't like that they were coming here, we even felt threatened that they might change our culture, 
overall, they were still very much like most Americans. It was familiar to us. And um, as a result of that, um, they had a pretty easy time of assimilating. But post-Civil War, we're going to have a new group, which are known as the New Immigrants, because we thought long and hard about that name. But these new immigrants are going to be very different. First of all, they're coming from South and Eastern Europe. So they're coming from places like Russia and Italy and Greece and Poland and places like that. And they were not considered white at the time, dark haired and dark eyed. They didn't really seem like most Americans. They also were coming from countries that were ruled by dictatorships or had a rise in the popularity of socialism or anarchy or communism. And um, that was really concerning to us because those are very undemocratic ideas. Many of them were Catholic, they were uneducated, and most of them had little job training that would be beneficial to us during this period of industrialization. So we were extremely nervous about them. Um, but there's gonna be some interesting differences and similarities between the old and the new immigrants. So first of all, with the new immigrants, why did they come here? Why did they come to America? Um, what pushed them out of their home countries is going to be things like overpopulation, which means that there's not enough jobs as well, um, problems of war, which were erupting all across Europe, as well as discrimination. If you were the wrong religion, if you were the wrong ethnicity within a certain country, you could not only pay higher taxes, but you could also not be allowed to vote. You might even have harsher punishments if accused of a crime. So um, it was difficult for these people. And so that pushed them out of their home countries. But what then led them to come to America instead? Well, what pulled them here is the same reason why people come here today. Economic opportunity, um, the ability to rise up the social ladder. Um, those were things that you didn't have as opportunities back home in Europe. If you were born poor, you were pretty much gonna die poor there. But here in America, we're known for rags to riches stories. And you have freedoms that you don't have anywhere else. Freedom of religion and freedom of, uh, of uh, speech. These were things that you just didn't see back home in Europe. Now, one thing that is unique about these new immigrants, though, as opposed to the old immigrants who came here and either moved out to the rural areas so that they could maintain their culture in peace or those that stayed in the cities quickly assimilated into American culture. The new immigrants stayed in the cities, but they did not assimilate. They created what we call an ethnic enclave. You probably know what this is, just didn't know it had a name. This is all of the uh, little Italy's, Korea towns, China towns, uh, little Poland's, little Russia's. These uh, ethnic enclaves or these ethnic neighborhoods allowed for these new immigrants to keep their culture and keep their traditions. They created schools that were based on their religion, Jewish schools, uh, you know, Hebrew schools and Catholic schools. Um, they created newspapers that not only told about what was going on at home, but they were also written in their home language. There was restaurants and stores that sold the foods that they knew at home. They had theaters that not only told the stories of their culture, but were also in their cultural, uh, traditional language, as well as social clubs where they could hang out with people who were from the same country. Uh, you know, oh, you're Russian, I'm Russian, we should hang out. This idea that you have a common culture, common holidays, common traditions, allowed for them to keep that alive. Um, however, not all of them are going to remain this way. Um, for example, on the top left picture, we see a picture of Little Italy in New York City. Now, uh, there are Little Italys in every major city across America, but Little Italy is not like actual Italy. Um, it is distinctly Italian-American. The food is not really totally Italian. The language is definitely not really uh, as spoken as much there anymore. They have definitely assimilated, but it is it has become its own thing. It is Italian American, or what we would sometimes call a hyphenated American. The other side that we see on the bottom right, that is a picture of San Francisco's Chinatown. And this has the highest concentration of Chinese people living in one area outside of the country of China. 
There are so many Chinese people that live in this very, very, very small area of San Francisco. And yet they have maintained a very traditional culture. The language is still spoken there. There is uh, Chinese language newspapers. There are Chinese language schools there. The restaurants serve truly ethnic um, and traditional foods. So it's not really been Americanized that much. So some of these ethnic enclaves are going to Americanize to a point while others remain very traditional. But if you are living outside of these ethnic enclaves, even though you might not be Italian or Polish or Russian or Chinese, these enclaves are going to change your culture because it gives you new opportunities that you would never have had before. You're going to get to try pasta for the first time. You're going to be introduced to kimchi. You're going to be introduced to these foods and these cultures and holidays and traditions that you would never have been introduced to without these truly ethnic centers. And that was something that was really exciting. Now, as far as similarities, College Board loves to look at the similarities and the differences between these two eras of immigration. So we've seen a lot of differences, but what are the similarities? Well, first of all, political machines are still using immigrants in order to keep themselves in power. Ones like Tammany Hall in New York City. Tammany Hall is going to be under new leadership, uh, no longer under Boss Tweed post-Civil War, but they're going to still use that immigrant vote as a way to maintain their power. The other thing is we're still going to see nativism. Prior to the Civil War, the main group was the Know Nothings. Now it's the American Protective Association. They both generally believe in the same thing. They want to stop immigration into America. They want to prevent immigrants from having power and, um, and freedoms in America. And they want to, quote unquote, keep America American. And so there are going to be these similarities um, that we are going to see between these two eras of immigration. And this picture right here, this graph, shows us what uh, American legal immigration looks like, where these people are generally coming from. And as you can see, we are going to have a massive upswing in the number of immigrants to the United States following the American Civil War. Most of them are going to be coming from Europe, but as you can also see, there is going to be a growing number of them coming from Asia as well as the Americas. And this is going to very much uh, be an impact on how we react to these various groups because we've never really had this many people coming in before. Even when we had um, the mass immigration pre-Civil War, it was never to the numbers that we see post-Civil War. And that's why we're going to have to create a process for figuring out who these people are. And that's where Ellis Island comes in. Ellis Island is going to be um, the main immigration station in the United States between 1892 and 1954 when it officially closes. But this small island that is right next door to Lady Liberty's Island um, in the middle of uh, New York Harbor, Ellis Island is where we are going to process all of these immigrants. Their boat is going to dock there first. Then once they've been processed, then they can get on another boat that will take them to their final destination, whether that's New York City or somewhere else. But Ellis Island is where they're all going to be processed first. So as they are getting off of the boats, they are going to need to bring all of their earthly belongings with them. And you see people who have these like things pinned to their chests. Those papers are actually the documentation to show that they are who they say they are and that they have um, the legal right to be here in the United States. Over 12 million immigrants are going to come through Ellis Island's doors in that roughly 50 year period. And nearly 40% of all Americans can trace their lineage back to somebody who came through Ellis Island. This opened up on January 1st, 1892, and the very first person to come through was a young Irish girl by the name of Annie Moore. Uh, she was uh, 17 years old. She came with her uh, younger siblings who uh, were 15 and 14 years, or uh, 12 years old. And uh, these younger brothers, uh, mom and dad basically had saved up enough money to send for their kids to now finally join them in America. So the picture you see here is the bronze statue of Annie Moore. 
um, that is there at Ellis Island. And there's actually a, um, a duplicate of this same statue that is actually in her hometown back home in Ireland. Now, when she got through the process and she was finished, you know, checking all the stuff in that she needed to, um, she was given by the warden of Ellis Island a gold coin. And it was more money than she had ever seen in her entire life. And word of this spread very quickly. And people started to think that in America, they were so generous. They're just going to give money away that in America, you know, they're so wealthy that they can, um, you know, that they can just hand money out. Now, um, the people, once they got there, they bring all their earthly belongings in and they were immediately taken away by porters who would take them and put them in another room. And people were terrified because this is everything that they own. However, all of this baggage was taken away for a reason. This process takes a very, very long time. And because of that, they didn't want people dragging this stuff around with them the whole time. So they would be able to retrieve it once they were finished with the process. Now, as I want to point out also, there are so many people coming through the doors that this is going to be very, very busy. For example, in the year 1907, the peak year of immigration, over a million people would be processed through the doors of Ellis Island alone, even though this isn't the only immigration center, it's just the main one. And so that tells us that this is going to take a long time. Now, as you are leaving this area, you're going to go up a grand staircase. And at the top of the staircase are two men who are standing there with pieces of chalk and on people's clothing, they are marking different letters and shapes and people are terrified that this means they've been marked for, you know, being kicked out, that they're going to be deported. But what that was actually all about, ladies and gentlemen, was having to do with a medical exam. Everybody was going to have to go through a medical exam because we had to make sure that the people coming into the U.S. were safe, that they were healthy, that they didn't have any diseases that were going to be dangerous um, or, you know, spread throughout the country. One in particular that the man you see here trying to check is something called trachoma. It's a very contagious eye disease. Um, kind of think of it as the like worse, meaner, awfuler cousin to pink eye that actually causes people to go blind. And it's very, very contagious. And the way that you can tell if somebody has it is by a discoloration on the underside of somebody's eyelid. And so they were having to flip everybody's eyelids upside down to identify if they had this disease or not. Now, the little shapes and letters that, pe excuse me, that people were getting on their clothing, that actually identified something that the medical doctors who were the ones that actually had the chalk, um, they were watching people go up the stairs and they were eyeballing to see if anybody had any diseases or anything wrong with them that might be a concern. Because we want the people coming into America to be productive members of society. And so we need to make sure like, do you have a, you know, a, an infectious disease like, you know, conjunctivitis, aka pink eye? Do you have, um, you know, something wrong with your, you know, wrong with your leg, um, you know, that's going to make it harder for you to get a job? Um, are you pregnant? We want to know, are you bringing one person into America or two? And so we want to make sure that the people that are going to come in here are going to be capable of getting a job and being productive members of society. If we noticed that you maybe had a mental defect or some kind of mental disease, then we would actually continue to test you with one of these little uh, pattern games that you see here. I might set out four blocks, take a smaller block and tap it on the top of each of the four blocks and have you then repeat the process for me. And if you can follow that pattern, I can see that you can follow directions. And if you can follow directions, then you generally should be able to get a job. You might not be, you know, a rocket scientist, but you can dig a ditch. And if you can dig a ditch, you can be a productive member of society. And that's what we were most concerned with. Now, when you got through this, you would then go to the Great Hall. And it's given that name because it was massive. This was a huge, 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 huge building. Uh, the picture that we see here is taken from only about halfway down the hallway. Um, and uh, it would hold thousands of people all at the same time. 
The people that you see um, underneath the American flag there, those are the clerks. They would call people up one at a time to check their paperwork against the ship's rosters, to make sure that they are who they said that they were and that everybody was there and accounted for. But things got a little interesting here because the people who were these clerks were being introduced to names that we were not used to seeing here in America. So considering some of these really difficult names that they came in to contact with, obviously these are not names that a lot of them had actually seen before. And so there's gonna be some problems with it. They're not gonna pronounce it correctly. The immigrants don't speak English. And while there were translators, there are going to be a lot of people whose names are changed upon arrival. Sometimes this was because the clerks themselves were confused and they misspelled it or mispronounced it. For example, um, the, uh, the uh, third name down on the left, it could be pronounced Nuchter or it could be pronounced Nichter, depending on where you were from, but it could have exactly the same spelling. And so you might see people with this same last name in America spelled N-U-C-H-T-E-R or N-I-C-H-T-E-R because it could have been just a confusion of the clerk who was writing it down. Sometimes it's because the immigrants themselves were illiterate and did not know how to spell their own names. So when, you know, you have somebody and you're asking them, you know, how do you spell your name? And they say, Vujic. Well, you don't really know how that's spelled and they don't know how to spell it. So you do the best you can and you spell it out phonetically. And so sometimes you'll see these people who have had their names Americanized because they and the clerks didn't know how to get it spelled correctly. But most of the time, it was because they wanted to make assimilation easier. Because if you had one of these last names, people very much knew that you were a new immigrant to America. And so if you wanted to make it easier to get a job or to just assimilate into society, you might change the pronunciation or even change the name entirely. For example, my family, when they came over here from Ireland, were the O'Hanrahans. However, the O in front of your name automatically pegs you as an Irish person. And since we were not exactly the most uh, desirable people back in the 1840s. They dropped the O and just were Hanrahan so that they could be a little less Irish and perhaps have an easier time of getting a job. Sometimes it was just because certain names were easier. Um, another great example is uh, uh, the, uh, the, the name there, Icos Pensados. The person that I know who has that last name, his first name was Vasilios which is a Greek name for William. However, his family, even though are very, very Greek, he goes by William he, because most people couldn't pronounce Vasilios correctly. So he just makes it easier and just goes by Will because it's easier for people to do. And so although the name and the tradition is important to them, sometimes assimilation was even more important. So once you got through that, you then got to go through these doors. Now, people were a little bit afraid because these doors, there were three different doors and each door went down a different stairwell. And people were afraid that maybe that meant that they were gonna be you know, uh, you know, know, sent away or deported or whatever. But in reality, there was nothing for them to be that concerned with. Um, only 2% of the people that arrived were excluded from entry. Even if you were sick, we generally put you in the hospital wing until you were better, and then we allowed you to enter into the United States. It was only if you had a contagious disease that was you know, endangering public health, if you had no legal right to be there, or if you were uh, a danger to society, like you were uh, not gonna be, um, uh, you know, uh, be able to support yourself, or if you were a violent criminal. Those are the people that we wouldn't let in. Everybody else, you pretty much got to go in. These three staircases just determined which of the boats you were gonna get on. One sent you to boats that were going northward, one sent you to boats that were going southward, and the one in the middle sent you to boats that were getting heading straight over towards New York City. And at the bottom of these stairs was waiting your family. And it became known as the kissing post. It was that this area where the families were now reunited, their family members got to meet up with them and pick them up to bring them back over 
to America. And um, this little statement right here from one of the matrons is such this wonderful viewpoint of how the different cultures interacted with each other and were able to, um, to you know, greet their family members that they missed. Ellis Island is so important to our country's culture. All of the people that you see here are famous Ellis Island immigrants, people who came to the United States and made a difference here, whether it is the science fiction novelist Isaac Asimov, who actually invented the word robot, or it was the composer Irving Berlin, who wrote some of our most iconic songs, including the patriotic song, God Bless America, and also the song White Christmas, not from America and yet wrote songs that were so iconic to America. Um, one of my personal favorites is uh, Chef Boyardi, Chef Ettore Boyardi of it uh, Italia, of Italy. He uh, opened up a restaurant and his food was really popular and people wanted to take it home. And so he gave them uh, jars of his pasta sauce with you know, the name of his restaurant on the side of it. And unfortunately people didn't know how nor cared to learn how to pronounce Italian correctly, so he had to write it out phonetically. How to pronounce Boyardi. Boy R D. Chef Boyardi was written out because dumb Americans just couldn't figure out how to pronounce Italian and yet totally changed our culture. You've got people in film, you've got actors, you've got um, uh, musicians and uh, all kinds of important people to our culture. And so these individuals, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it are all going to make America more diverse and more interesting culturally as a result of them coming through Ellis Island. But not everybody came through Ellis Island. In fact, here on the West Coast, we had a totally different situation when it came to immigration. And as you can tell from the image here, most of the people that were going to be immigrating to America on the West Coast were not coming from Europe. They were coming from Asia. And there was going to be a dramatic difference in the way that we treated them versus the European immigrants that came through Ellis Island. So we need to back up just slightly. We need to go back to about the 1830s and 40s. During that period of time, we have a mass migration of Chinese workers into the United States. Now, initially, they were tolerated because they were cheap labor, and we were using them on the railroads, and they were working in laundromats, and they were doing all of this stuff that was kind of the crappy labor that no American wanted to do. But as time goes on, and jobs get tight, and we go through different financial struggles of the 1800s, suddenly we become more and more fearful of the differences between us and these Chinese immigrants. First of all, their culture is so different from mainstream America. They have weird religious beliefs, their food's weird, their language is strange, they dress weird. And because of all of this, we, we just don't recognize anything in them that we see of ourselves. One of the other big things that we demonize them for was their recreational use of opium. Now, don't get me wrong, Americans were totally addicted to opium too, but that was through medicines specifically ones like laudanum, which we talked about in our lesson on the Wild West. However, although Americans are using opium because we consider it quote unquote medicine, they're using it for funsies. And so because of that, we see it as laziness and you know degenerate behavior. And so they were unable to have that same you know American dream as was offered to the people on the East Coast. They were relegated to menial labor. They were not allowed to get a job in the government or run for any office. They were uh, not allowed to, in many cases, get higher paying jobs. They were not allowed to get a license to be a lawyer. Some cases they were not even allowed to get a license to do even more um, menial jobs like even being a barber. They were given the jobs that nobody else would do. And yet, at the same time, we were also accusing them of stealing Americans' jobs which I do find quite impressive that they were doing the jobs that nobody wanted while also stealing jobs while also being lazy. Doing all three at once, that's, that's pretty impressive. Um, so clearly there's a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment. Um, probably the most outspoken person of this 
is Dennis Kearney, who was a California labor leader from Ireland, who was very outspoken in his nativism and racist views about Chinese immigrants. And he's going to be one of the people that is pushing for us to eliminate Chinese immigrants from coming to America. And in 1886, we do just that. We passed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1886, which bans the immigration of the Chinese. And it is the very first immigration law in America. They are the first, um, essentially, illegal immigrants in the United States because they are anyone that comes in after that is not coming into the country legally. Now, eventually, we do eliminate this law. And that law is going to then open up the doors for more people from Asia to come into the U.S. But we were very, very limited in who we allowed in. And that is going to happen at Angel Island. Angel Island is a small island right next to Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay. And it was the main Western immigration center between 1910 and 1940. And most of the people coming there were coming from Asia, specifically from China. Um, and the treatment that they had was absolutely horrific in comparison to what we saw happening to the people uh, on the East Coast. The Europeans coming on the East Coast generally were treated well. They, you know, it was busy, it was crowded, and it was a long, long process to get through, you know, Ellis Island. It might take you over eight hours to get through that process. But you generally got to come to America the same day, not Angel Island. They were held for days, weeks, months, and even years on the island, refusing to be allowed, uh, refused their, you know, the ability to come into the United States. They would be interrogated time and time and time again. Where are you from? Where are you going? What job are you going to have? Who are you staying with? Et cetera, et cetera. And if your answers changed at all, we saw that as a reason to kick you out. And many of the people were still deported, despite the fact that they really had every right to be here. And the reason for that was just simple racism. We didn't particularly love there being all these new immigrants coming in on the East Coast, but at least they were European. At least they were kind of similar to most of us. But these, you know, Asian immigrants, they were so different from us that we just didn't trust them to come in. And so unfortunately, Angel Island has a much darker history than what we see of Angel Island. So the overall effects of immigration. First of all, huge public debates over assimilation and Americanization. Should we essentially force these people to be American? You know, uh, there was a, a, an increase in the number of English language classes being taught, classes on American culture and understanding our culture. Um, so that they could be effective and productive and successful members of society. There was this idea of the American melting pot, that all of these strange cultures would melt into this new, you know, new form of a new American culture. They would no longer be English or Irish or German or French or Polish or Russian. They would just be American. However, for immigrants, it was a different story because some people believed that it was possible and it was important for them to maintain some of their traditional culture. And they did have to negotiate compromises between the cultures that they brought and the culture they found in the United States. This is where we get this idea of the quote unquote hyphenated American being Italian American, Irish American, Russian American, because you weren't fully American, but you weren't fully Irish anymore, or Russian, or Polish anymore. You were something new, something different. And that did leave you in many ways separated from the rest of society. But on the other hand, although it wasn't necessarily an American melting pot, it does create what we sometimes refer to as the American salad bowl. Because a salad with just lettuce is really boring. You got to have all the other stuff, right? You got to have the croutons and the tomatoes and you got to have some onions and all kinds of different stuff inside your salad to make it interesting. And that's what each of these different cultures brought to America was a little bit of their culture that made the overall finished American culture a lot more diverse and a lot more rich.